Thank you so much for joining us at this opening session of the 2015 GRCC Race, Ethnicity, and Identity Conference. Tonight, we have a very special guest, backed by popular demand, Dr. Marie Price, full professor of geography and international affairs at George Washington University. Marie is also vice president of the American Geographical Society, and she is one of the authors of the textbook we use here in our World Regional Geography course at GRCC, and the author of numerous other publications. I could say all kinds of great things about her, but then I'll be the one that's talking instead of her, and you, I'm sure, want to listen to her. Lastly, let me tell you this. She is an extraordinary geographer that does great work in the field. Please welcome Dr. Marie Price. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. And uh, can you hear me all right back there? Great. Um, usually, if you see this many people on a Monday night, there's pizza promise. So I'm very impressed that you showed up. So uh, I'm a geographer. I've been a professor at George Washington University for 25 years. And I would say, especially the last 15 years of my career, I've spent a lot of time writing about, thinking about immigration. So today's talk is a little biographical, autobiographical about my research. Um, it's also a bit of geographic history. I'm going to talk about a seminal figure in the field, uh, Carl Sauer. And, and then it's also uh, with these three concepts. I'm going to talk about diffusion, movement, of particularly of people, talk about deflection, of how there's often pushback when large numbers of people move around and how people react to um, changing demographic trends. And then finally, I'm going to talk about diversity and living with diversity. And there's a geographical perspective to it, but obviously there's a larger psychological, sociological perspective. And a project I was involved in uh, the last few years with uh, UNESCO and uh, UN Habitat was to try and think of tools or um, uh, a toolkit that your localities, especially cities, would find useful in dealing with greater and greater diversity. Because most of the immigrants in the um, world today are more likely or not moved to cities. And cities are the places that handle um, very diverse populations. So uh, buckle up your seat belts. We'll, uh, we'll be touring around the world. So let me begin with a figure you've probably never heard of, unless you're a, a geographer, and, and even then you might not have, a man named Carl Sauer. He was um, a professor of geography at UC Berkeley, uh, a leader of 20th century geography. He brought some very important concepts to the discipline. He is a human geographer. He called himself a cultural geographer. And one of these was the concept of the cultural landscape, which is this idea that cultural values, practices get infused in how we design our places, plant our crops, worship our, our various gods. And that looking at that landscape uh, gives us uh, important evidence of the relationship between people and their environment. And this is, can be a very simple concept or a very complex concept. But uh, Sauer used the cultural landscape idea not so much in looking at immigration um, but I've used it in some of my work in immigration, and I'll illustrate how in just a few slides. The other term that Sauer uh, really embedded into the language that geographers use isn't alone. It really comes from a German tradition of cultural diffusion. And that is this idea that uh, uh, human beings as culture groups have our tools, ideas, practices, and these ideas spread around. And historically, ideas spread around from the earliest homo sapiens of people moving from place to place and introducing ideas. They were, of course, a separate invention. Sauer's interest in cultural diffusion was looking at very uh, uh, traditional cultural practices, agriculture in particular. And he wrote this important book on agricultural diffusion. 
in the, in the 1930s, before people were really had become foodies and so interested in food production, where food came from. He was ahead of his time. Uh, but I've also found this idea of cultural diffusion very useful as I think about immigration and some of the consequences of immigration. So these are long-standing ideas in human geography. I'm not applying them quite the way Carl Sauer would, but I have found them useful, and hopefully you will too, as we, we look at the world of immigration. So one way to think about cultural uh, diffusion is the movement of people. And uh, that movement really has intensified in the last uh, 30 years. Um, this is a map showing metropolitan Washington, uh, a place where I've done a lot of work. And many of my examples will be from Washington. And showing where people come from that have settled in Washington. Washington now, uh, the metropolitan area, not just the District of Columbia, but the close in suburbs of Maryland and Virginia is uh, about 5.5 million people. And about 1.1 million are foreign born. So basically, one in five people in the metropolitan area, 20%, were born in another country and are now living uh, in the metropolitan area. And as you can see, they come from a very diverse range of places, uh, from Europe, from Africa, South Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia, Central America, Mexico, and even South America, a little bit from the Caribbean. Okay? So um, you end up in this very diverse area. Another way of showing that is the, the ever popular uh, pie, pie chart. Um, the largest foreign born group is El Salvador, which is a little unusual. They're not usually the largest group. Typically in US cities, Mexicans are the largest group. Uh, then after El Salvador is India. And China, India and Chinese are definitely part of immigrant waves that intensified in the, in the 90s, 80s and 90s, especially 90s and on. Then Korea, um, actually that chart is probably should be Philippines, then Mexico, Vietnam, Guatemala, Ethiopia, Peru, Bolivia, Honduras, Pakistan, Ghana, Iran, Nigeria, and then other. Um, so this is a city, not, a little like, unlike some of the other large metropolitan areas in the US that attracts a very diverse range of people, a mix of very high skilled labor and, and low skilled labor, people with college degrees and the people that have barely graduated or maybe haven't even graduated high school. Um, and most of them have come in the last 20 years. Um, so this is not a traditional immigrant destination like uh, New York City or Chicago. Um, it's, uh, it's grown rather quickly and is indicative of, a, of how uh, immigration um, has intensified and maybe become much more globalized. So one way to look at the global picture of immigration, this is not the most exciting bar graph in the world, but uh, UN, United Nations Population Division, estimates that there's about uh, 215 million immigrants in the world. So that would be maybe about the size of Brazil, maybe a little small, you know, substantial number of people. Um, but at the same time, um, those 215 million people, which is, in, is going up in, in absolute numbers, you see, in, uh, if you can see this chart, um, there is a big uptick in uh, the 1990s. And part of that is, as um, the end of the Cold War, there was a lot more uh, migration uh, was possible. Um, it still only represents anywhere between 2 or 3% of the world's population. So on one level, you have more and more people moving. But it's still only 3% of the world's population. So why do people get 3%? That's nothing. You know, Why are people get so excited about immigration? Well, one of the reasons is, is that where they go is very uneven. It's not 3% evenly distributed throughout the world. They go to lots of uh, uh, particular places. And still, the largest destination uh, country in the world is the United States in terms of the foreign born. And as a geographer, what interests me is, is that uh, spatial differentiation. Why do some places get so many immigrants? Why do some places get so few? Who comes to those places? Are every place like a Washington hyper diverse, or do you get very, very distinct streams? So there's, there's a, a lot of ways to analyze immigration in terms of a movement of people and a, a cultural diffusion. 
In particular, I've done a lot of research looking at how cities receive immigrants, and the main message of this bar graph will take Canada, for example. If you look at the percentage of foreign-born in all of Canada, uh, it's actually higher than the United States. It's around, say, 18% of the country's foreign-born. But then if you look at Toronto, the largest city in Canada, metropolitan Toronto is about 41% foreign-born. So proportionally, cities are the places where you have a higher number and a higher pro proportion uh, of foreign-born. And so a lot of times, it's cities that have to be the places that come up with policies to either deal with including diverse people or sometimes trying to, to push people uh, away. And whether you were looking at a, um, a New York City, a similar pattern, very high foreign-born, th over 35% metropolitan New York. But the United States is about, say, uh, 12, well, now 13% foreign-born, much lower. And then this map, this isn't showing all the immigrants in the world, and it's not showing all the cities either. Uh, but some collaborative work I did with my colleague Lisa Benton Short, we asked the question of the large cities of the world, cities that are at least a million, or metropolitan areas, where do the most immigrants go? And that was not an easily answered question, because most uh, international agencies collect foreign-born data at the state level, not at the urban level. Uh, but in asking that question, uh, this map comes up with some clear, important areas where large cities attract large numbers of immigrants. The bright red dots are places that have more than a million foreign-born. And then uh, the yellow dots, or the yellow-green dots, between 250,000 and less than a million. And then 250,000 or less, uh, uh, 100,000, are the purple dots. So you see places, North America, both Canada and the US, Europe, all the way to, to Russia, uh, the, the Middle East, especially the Gulf states, and, and Saudi Arabia and Israel that have large numbers of foreign-born. And uh, you know, other settlement countries like Singapore or Taiwan or Australia has many immigrants. Um, and then there's some places that are blank, not because they're not immigrants, but we just don't have really good data on that. A lot of African cities would be an example of that. And Chinese cities definitely have a growing uh, migrant population, a lot of internal migrants. And they have a growing immigrant population. But unfortunately, that data are, are not available. So, Thinking back on that pie chart I showed you of Washington, a project I did, uh, started on and still work on about 15 years ago, was looking at really hyper diverse places. And this place, I don't know if any of you ever heard of Wheaton, Maryland. It's a suburb outside of Washington. When we did our analysis, we found that people from 135 countries settled in Wheaton, Maryland. Um, it is really diverse. And going back to the idea of diversity and diffusion and cultural landscape, these are some of the images of taken of uh, Wheaton. I guess you're trying to, not too many people on this, but more signs. Um, you have the Filipino home baking and grocery store next to Moby Dick Sushi. I don't think I'd want to eat Moby Dick Sushi, but uh, you know the vision of a whale and sushi doesn't, don't work for me, but a Japanese restaurant followed by some other ethnic place. Uh, Banco Americ uh, uh, Amercio, and then uh, Sarita's hair fixings, and uh, also a sari place, a Guatemalan bakery. And then this uh, innocuous looking building, uh, the Central uh, Employment Center of Wheaton, was a day labor site um, that the, uh, the city and the county, in collaboration with an organization called Casa de Maryland, created so day laborers have a place to gather, register, and, and, and seek work. Um, so this particular locality, recognized its diversity. And some of the county leaders said, well, why don't we market this diversity? Make us a, 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 an attractive destination. And uh, they began a campaign called Wheaton, Deliciously Habit Forming, where they encourage people to come to Wheaton, experience delicious ethnic food, and still be able to park your car, unlike Washington, DC, which has a hard hard time parking. Um, and uh, that was certainly uh, an, an attempt to uh, be inclusive and, and celebrate the, the community's diversity, which is incredibly uh, significant. 
But sometimes diversity and uh, and is not such a obvious there's landscape markers. So this is a p soccer field, a ball field. It could be anywhere in America. This just happens to be in the suburbs of Northern Virginia. And it's pretty unremarkable, except on Sundays when the Bolivian leagues form. And, uh, and the leagues are organized by uh, the villages in which the Bolivian laborers come from. So there's a team from a place called Tiataco, and a team from Mamanaca, and a team from Abierto, and they organize. And these teams play, and, and money is collected, and then depending on how you do in the season, funds are then transferred back to the villages. One of those places where a lot of people leave is Bolivia, um, a pretty poor country in South America, about 10 million people. And a real center of uh, out-migration is uh, the city of Cochabamba, there's a department called Cochabamba, and then these smaller areas. And so the pictures I'm going to show you of uh, and this map, Cochabamba is on the top left corner. And then this valley, the high valley, Valle Alto, has uh, been a fascinating place for me to do work and make connections with my home in Washington and also a large immigrant community that leaves the Valle Alto and, and works in Washington. Um, so this area is very high. The, even though it's a valley, it's flat, it's farming, they grow wheat and corn. It's about at 9,000 feet. We don't grow wheat and corn in the mid-latitudes at 9,000 feet, but you can in the tropics. And it's very fertile and has long been an important agricultural area. And uh, flying over this area in a small plane, you see these are very modest communities, though many of them go back hundreds of years. They were indigenous peoples here speaking Quechua. And then the Spanish came and colonized, gave them plazas and iglesias and, and more of the Spanish language. Um, but you also get into these villages and you sense some ruptures in the landscape. Um, so how do you get go from that to that? How do you think? Right? Well, that, they wouldn't call themselves expats, but they call them the, the residentes del norte, the, the residents in the north. So these are people that have worked. Actually, it didn't necessarily begin in the United States. A, a really important labor destination for Bolivians is Argentina. It's a neighboring country, and it's been more prosperous. But these sorts of homes um, built by returns, or at least the remittances from people who have left, popped up all over the valley and uh, are a real expression of success, of obtaining uh, a dream. Uh, when some people describe to me the, the great shortcut of going to another country, earning enough cash, and then coming back to be able to build a nice home, buy some land. And, and there's a real tradition of, of doing that. Um, one of the people that I've interviewed pretty extensively from a small village, um, Mamanaka, talks about how as he was a young man, he first went to Argentina, then he went to the United States, then he came back. And three of his sons are working overseas, two in the US, one in the United, uh, two in the US, one in Argentina. And he's building these homes with the money they sent in the intent for them all to return. Um, so even though we tend to think that all immigrants are coming to stay, there's certainly a, a backflow. And especially if it's just one member of the household and you have uh, spouses and children uh, in your origin country still there, you're more than likely to go back so you can, can be with your family. And, and this man who was at one point the, um, I guess, the mayor of the small communities, you know, was, was thankful for his opportunities, even though um, um, he had earned money both in two different countries and was very happy back in Mamanaka. The other interesting thing that happens with return uh, migration and remittances are investments. In It's been really instructive for me to go back to this area several years and see the changes. So, for example, that building in the, the middle is a community house that was built with remittances. A few thousand dollars sent every year, and now there's this community center where young people can gather and they can have talks or concerts or events. Um, I don't know exactly why this is a landlocked country, but in another town in the plaza, they created a bronze statue of a mermaid. Don't know what that means. <laughs> and I've tried to figure out, why did you pick a mermaid? But uh, she's sitting there. She looks lovely. Um, 
But more obvious in terms of the passion for, for football or soccer, this enormous stadium was built with collaboration from remittances, from immigrants, and also actually some money from the local community. Um, this is a very small village. That soccer stadium could probably see thousands, and people come from all around. Churches are another thing, or, or businesses are more uh, lavish uh, houses. And then how do you navigate? You know, Bolivia is not very close to Washington. It's a long stretch, or any of these distant migrants. Some Bolivians um, work in Spain, others in Argentina, some in the United States. And these transnational lives get quite tricky. Um, but some of the things I've learned, for example, the, the man in the black hat in the top, he made his living in Florida for a while, came back, and is now the mayor of his small town. And he feels that, you know, I have made some money and I want to make changes in this town. And his town accepted him and he's, he's been a good leader. Uh, one of the things that the, the mayor has uh, the mayor's office there is in green. Again, this is a modest little village, but there's a new uh, school, new uh, health care facility, and, uh, and, and a lot more outreach. So sort of taking some of the experiences people have had abroad and, and, and bringing them back. But there's still that painful reality of families that are stretched very long dif distances. It gets hard to do when parents are elderly. And, and this space here, the lower right hand uh, photo is the outside deck when planes come in and out and families, members say goodbye to each other, sometime for years at a, at a time. It can be quite a, a dramatic space and it speaks to that real, the, the real um, human dimensions of, of immigration and what does it mean to leave your home for, for long periods of time. So as I've worked in immigration and worked in different parts of the world and, and in the United States, I, I've certainly seen experiences of real backlash, uh, or sometimes uh, what I've called deflection of pushback. And this could be different ordinances passed at the local level to uh, increased raids by ICE to remove people that do not have papers. And uh, a colleague of mine at the Migration Policy Institute, which is a fantastic think tank in Washington. They have all kinds of information on migration in, uh, all over the world. And if you're interested in it, I highly recommend it. You can download all their reports for free. Um, he's with a name like Dimitri Papa Dimitria. He's Greek. And uh, he's written a lot about migration. And he says, no matter the place, whether it's a longtime immigrant destination or a new one, there's always this potential for backlash, and it comes. You know, why do people resent the newcomers? Is it because they look different, or they speak another language, or they have another religion, or that it's been responsible for a lot of dramatic demographic change? And, and sometimes these are, reactions can be uh, more, more moderate, and sometimes they can be quite severe. Um, but I've, I've termed this deflection, or I haven't, there have been other sociologists, Ivan Light, who's looked at this, is a kind of pushing away and, and what happens uh, at, on the landscape or in communities. So again, turning to a local example, though you could fill in the blank with many places, um, one of a really uh, profound place of deflection happened in uh, Herndon, Virginia where they received a very rapid influx of especially Latino immigrants, but immigrants from South Asia and East Asia as well. And uh, in response to the uh, mayor sending up a day labor center and, and people not liking it, um, there were a lot of ugliness uh, going to town council meetings and lots of uh, unkind and, and really bitter comments made. Um, in this example here, there was a concern about day laborers uh, congregating on sidewalks, and so there was a law passed that you couldn't stand uh, on the sidewalks for a long period of time looking for work. Then in another county, Prince William, also in Virginia, about a year after this incident, there was a, a 287G agreement signed, and then a more aggressive act, which said basically the police have the authority to ask or stop anybody and ask them for their papers. So how many of you, if you were pulled over by police, could prove that you are an American? 
Doesn't say on your driver's license. Could you prove it? You, how many people have like their birth certificate with them at all times? No. Who, did you, who do you think would get pulled over and asked to show their identity? It would be mostly Latinos. It was very clearly racially profiled. Okay? Um, and in fact, I had a lot of sympathy for the sheriff of this county. I had a chance to interview him. And I said, do you, what would happen if there was amnesty the next day and you didn't have to ask these questions if people were made legal that were not? And he said, oh, my life would be so much better because this is an impossible policy to enforce. It's expensive and there's no right way to do it. You know, you either ask everybody or nobody, you know. Um, and, and there has been a lot of backlash on this. And as a result, actually, a lot of Latinos left this county. And this headline in Spanish, una tierra prohibida, you know, prohibited land, you know, get out. And this is in a, a Washington Hispanic newspaper. So you could see that very clear deflection, pushback. Granted, the county leader said, well, we're not uh, anti-immigrant. We're just anti-illegal immigrant, which is often the, the you know, fair enough statement. But how do you tell if someone's legal and illegal? And oftentimes, it's from um, looking uh, at someone's race and ethnicity or their accent and then uh, surmising from there. So in terms of deflection nationally, whether you know it or not, we have entered the period of the most removal of people from America than ever in our history. Um, it's over 4 million removals. And uh, this is the showing the majority, the red bar, are Mexicans. Uh, the green bar shows Central American. In this slide, you can see the Central American numbers really tick up after 2005. And then South Americans have stayed uh, flat. Um, so what does removal mean? This is not so much stopping people at the border, but actually removing them after they've lived in the United States for sometimes days, sometimes years. Um, and so this change, and you can see it really kicks off uh, 2000, you can see 2006, 2007, 2008. And um, actually, I, I meant to put in my updated graph. I'm sorry, I forgot I didn't update this one. Um, it, it stayed around the 400,000 level. And the last data was 2013. It was well over 400,000. To put it in perspective, more people have been removed in the last 10 years than in the entire history of the United States. So this is a big change, a very profound example of deflection. Some people may be removed and try to come back, no doubt about that. These numbers are, are flawed, to be sure. But these are the ones that the, um, uh, the Department of Homeland Security provides. And, uh, and then if you look at, by some groups, Mexicans are overwhelmingly the most likely to be removed. But proportionally, there are much fewer Central Americans, and they are actually a larger uh, for their size in the United States, have even had a greater uh, impact. And mo mostly the result of not having immigration reform for uh, decades, the last major reform was in 1986. So most of you were not born then. Uh, there was a little immigration reform in 96, but it was mostly border enforcement, intensifying the security of the border. Um, and then people thought there'd be reform in 2006, didn't happen, 2010 didn't happen, 2013 still hasn't happened. There's certainly this pent up uh, anxiety, especially among Latinos who uh, are often the most likely to be removed from the United States if they can't prove their uh, um, uh, identity and uh, legal status. Um, and yet, many times, these are people that have been raised here. Their children speak only English. Um, and it, it's a very hot level issue for Latinos. It might not be as strongly felt by other communities. And there's a geography to this, what I call the geographies of tolerance or intolerance. So this was uh, FOIA data, you know, Freedom of Information Act. Uh, that is kept at this institute in Syracuse. 
And what it's mapping is the likelihood, if you're convicted of entering unauthorized, basically not having your legal right to be in the United States, what is the likelihood that you'll be removed? So again, sometimes uh, in states like uh, Oregon or New York or even Washington, you might be convicted, but you aren't removed. And more than half the people aren't removed. And some of these, some of this pattern falls in maybe some of the more immigrant uh, um, friendly destinations or places that have large immigrant communities. But boy, you see the, the southern US, Arizona, Texas, New Mexico, Utah, Louisiana, Alabama. If you're convicted for entering a 90, 83 to 95% chance you'll be removed. Um, so what, what is this? Why are some places um, much more adamant about removal and then others are, the lowest one actually in the data was Oregon. For some reason, only a third of people would be removed in Oregon. You know, judicial discretion. It's one set of laws, but different courts uh, view them uh, in, in different ways. In the upper Midwest, where we are right now, kind of right in the middle, maybe a little more likely to deport than some other areas. One of the groups that has been most vocal and is, I think, a really important source for changing attitudes are the dreamers. Have you all heard of the dreamers? Yes, you know? So dreamers are young people who were raised here, probably brought into the United States at young, two, three, five, went to schools. Oh, I lost my image. I don't know what that happened. Maybe you could troubleshoot for me, Mike. Um, and um, they firmly believe they're American in the sense that you, you went to public high schools, those of you, every day say in the Pledge of Allegiance. People still do that, right? Yes? No? Oh, gosh, I remember. Maybe It's been a while. My, my kid's school. Um, uh, and uh, you know, the learning the civics lessons and the local geography and all that. And then the interesting thing about dreamers is a lot of times families keep secrets, and especially about undocumented status. And most, um, a lot of dreamers, and I've had a chance to interview them, and there's a lot of essays, learn that they're illegal around the time they're 16. Why do you think 16 would be an important age? Driver's license. You can't get a driver's license unless you can prove you're here legally, right? So all of a sudden, 16, the, to me, when I was 16, that was the most important thing. I didn't want a car. I just wanted to be able to drive, right? Driver's license. And then you can stay, get educated up to high school. And then afterwards, you're 18. You can't drive. You can't work. You can't go to college in a lot of places. You can't have a bank account. I mean, all they basically learn feeling a part of the society to falling off a cliff and not being invisible or feeling the fear of deportation. So the dreamers have become a really important political voice in America. And they have the networks all over the country. But a huge change for the dreamers was in, uh, uh, there was a Dream Act. It, it, it lost by five votes uh, a few years ago, um, would have given legal status to these, but DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals was signed as an executive order by President Obama in 2012. And, and basically, about 700,000 youth have been able to get DACA status. It means you don't have to worry about being deported. You have to renew every two years. But to get DACA, you have to have finished high school. And uh, you can't have any illegal or arrest records. And uh, so, so not, not as many people have received DACA as people had hoped. Uh, but I have uh, worked with a lot of dreamers. And I have found uh, that work very gratifying, a way of giving back to someone who's written a lot about immigration and, and collaborated with them on, on some projects. And one of the real uh, rewarding moments in terms of this tension between exclusion and inclusion was in April of last year, um, the uh, Attorney General of Virginia recognized DACA as a legal status and that would confer in-state tuition for uh, 
uh, Virginia students. So if you went to a Virginia high school, graduated from Virginia high school, proved you've lived in Virginia so many years, you could then get in-state tuition, which is a game changer for a lot of students who want to go on and get higher education. So these are a group of uh, scholars that an organization I've worked with have supported. Um, to think about inclusion and exclusion, a lot of my work the last few years has been trying to give tools and ideas to think about, so communities think about how do you be more inclusive, especially in the context of the likelihood of more immigration and, and greater diversity. This isn't work I've done. This is Kyle Lettner and Hel uh, Kyle Walker and Helga Lettner, uh, two geographers who have tried to map inclusion, exclusion. And it just happened to be one of their case studies was metropolitan Washington. And uh, the blue areas tend to be more inclusionary. Their hypothesis is that it's the inner cities that tend to be more inclusionary, more racially diverse, the inner suburbs a little more, and then the outer suburbs pushing back more, more exclusionary. And when they, when they talk about exclusionary, they're talking about policies that, um, like say, 287G ordinances that allow local police to stop and question people on their immigration status and, and other uh, policies, but that's the most common one. So what I've taken from that, and, and no matter a new immigrant destination, an old immigrant destination, a place that suddenly received people, didn't used to, there is a, most places have a range of experiences. Some, some neighborhoods, communities, areas will be more inclusionary, others less. States can certainly set the agenda, um, and so obviously can the federal government. So there's this real um, scaling up and down of policies at state, federal, and local uh, levels that can make places feel more welcoming or, or feel more exclusionary. And I think this map sort of shows the, the complexity of that. So why does this matter? Um, there's a political scientist, Robert Putnam, at Harvard University, and he's written a lot about social capital and our sense of belonging and, and uh, identity. And, and he is shown through these large databases, some people think it's controversial, others uh, buy it, that through more and more immigration and more diversity, in the short to medium run, there is a loss of social capital, a loss of social solidarity. He has this metaphor that when we get into really diverse environments, it brings out the turtle in all of us. We want to close in and, and maybe not uh, deal with more complex environments. But in the medium to long front run, these more diverse societies create enormous opportunities, abilities to learn, new skills, and, and if the negative can, effects can be controlled. Uh, there are certainly many positive outcomes. So there's this whole school of thought about the creative class and the social capital that comes from uh, large scale um, immigration and more diverse places. But I think the, the final point is that the, very important, that the central challenge for modern diversifying societies is to create a new broader sense of we. The place, uh, your experience of America as a melting pot is probably very different from what your parents experienced. And your children are going to experience an even different place as the ethnic and racial mixing of America uh, proceeds. So how do we build a broader sense of we? Living with diversity is not easy. And in fact, there's always been tensions, even in a country like the United States that has had a long history of immigration. Um, and yet, it's central to how we're going to have to, to live together to build that sense of we. So I'm going to shift now to a little bit of uh, my policy work and then wrap up quickly for, for comments or questions. Um, one is, because there's been inaction at the federal level, there's been a lot of activity at the state and local level. And a real leader has been uh, California and Governor Jerry Brown. He basically signed what it was called the Trust Act, California Assembly Law Bill 4, and basically said, look it, 
we'd rather have people in, living in California with driver's licenses than without them. So no matter what the federal government says, we're gonna offer driver's licenses. It's a public safety issue. Then he said, if you grew, do well in a California high school and you're educated and you wanna go study physics and get into Berkeley, why should we stop you, you know? Because you were born here, you don't have the paper, so they, basically California has gone on to enact a DREAM Act that uh, could have existed at the federal level several years ago, but did not. Um, meanwhile, other localities living with diversity, this is a, a, a Seoul Plaza, it's not in Seoul, Korea, it's in Annandale, Virginia, and if you ever get to Annandale, you have your choice of Korean barbecue, at least 20 restaurants, so keep that in mind. So what do, we, what do I mean by inclusion? In a project I worked on with uh, people at um, UNESCO and UN Habitat was an international collaboration from people from all over the world thinking about inclusion issues, especially this is pressing for Europeans and, and North Americans, but parts of East Asia and Southeast Asia as well. And I think the, the collab, we agreed on the term inclusion more than integration because inclusion applies a kind of, you know, accepting of people, a, a sort of tolerance without necessarily making people to become some general identity. And so as we thought about inclusion, and this was a bunch of um, round tables and surveys and working in different places, we came up with several ways of thinking about inclusion. And this is not the same as citizenship. We're not saying giving you know, people residency, but we're saying if you have lots of diverse people in place, how do you think about making this place, this town, this city, this neighborhood working better? Um, so one of the things, I'm a geographer, we thought about spatial inclusion. You know, Get an idea of where people are residing when they're not. Are immigrants really clustered in one place or are they widely dispersed throughout the city? Um, again, I, I, I throw up another Washington map, but in the Washington story, immigrants are quite dispersed. Um, there are a few clusters, but they're more suburban than inner city. And that's sort of in telling, this is a map, you know, some of the places where there was some of the most conflict also had large numbers of, of immigrants and had really rapid demographic change. Um, but you can also map other things, you know, by different countries of origin, by language use, by places of investment, recreation, to sort of get a sense of where people set are in acting and what, what are the factors that make certain places more attractive than others. Political inclusion is, is a very big issue and very contentious. Um, and not necessarily talking about citizenship, but it is interesting, not as common in the US, but there are US jurisdictions that let uh, non-citizens vote in local elections, say like school board. Um, and that happens actually a lot in Europe. They figure if you live in a place, you wanna have some say at the local level of who leads, who directs things. Um, certainly creating paths to citizenship. It happens more in countries of settlement. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of places where large numbers of immigrants go, such as the UAE or Saudi Arabia, where the paths to citizenship are basically non-existent. Some localities deal with things like immigrant advisory councils, trying to get a sort of voice and perspective, and then looking at um, labor uh, laws, making sure that both uh, native-born and foreign-born are, are treated fairly. Economic inclusion has been a very interesting one. You're certainly the ethnic economy is visible in lots of cities. I've always been fond of this place. This is a, a big Vietnamese center in Virginia, which flies the South Vietnamese flag, which says something about their uh, affinity. Um, but a lot of work on uh, getting uh, immigrants to open bank accounts, to use, uh, to develop credit, this is for legal immigrants and even uh, undocumented ones. Um, targeting minority communities' access to credit, this you know, can, can also lead to abuses, but uh, there's been certainly uh, a real effort to, to uh, make the foreign born, in some cases, a more visible, active, and um, formal part of economic communities. And then cultural or social inclusion. 
One of the sort of unsung heroes in immigration and inclusionary efforts in the United States are public libraries. Um, especially in places that have very large foreign-born populations, it's often the public libraries that provide access to information about community outreach and uh, material in different languages, the internet. So this is a public library that has a welcome sign in uh, 13 different languages. Um, uh, but there's also rec centers, sports centers, all the kind of outreach that might allow different social cultural groups to both participate in uh, the broader social center and also have a, a place to belong to. And then various federal initiatives and state initiatives, such as the um, development agencies or minority businesses, since many of the foreign born um, in the United States are ethnic minorities, they're uh, eligible for some of these loans. And, and so there's been this interesting, some of the uh, programs that were set up uh, to reach out to native born um, ethnic minorities actually are quite relative to the uh, integration of, of foreign-born ethnic minorities. <coughs> and then lastly, uh, this project that I did with the uh, UNESCO UN Habitat called Migrants Inclusion in Cities. If you go to my um, George Washington University Marie Price, there, my website, you can download this. It's in English and Spanish. Uh, and it's a toolkit to try and think about what are the things that localities might need to consider as they deal with increasing diversity and uh, building a better sense of the we we have become. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. There's time for questions, I hope. Marie, thank you so much for a very captivating lecture. Uh, we're, we're richly rewarded. Questions? I saw hands going up over here. Thank you. When it comes to um, immigrants coming to other countries, one of the main arguments is the country that's receiving the immigrant, uh, they're stealing their jobs. Mm -hmm. From your research, um, I just wanted, I was just curious on your point of view on that. Mm. So, uh, economists in particular have looked at this question a lot. And you will not be surprised to learn that there are economists that argue both, that they create more jobs or that they take away jobs. And a lot of it probably matters where you're talking about. But um, having talked to a lot of economists and read them, I think in general the feel feeling is immigration and countries that have large immigrant populations tend to be economically more robust. It's a, a chicken and egg thing, though immigrants are probably coming because there are jobs, right? Uh, so um, that, uh, that argument just never goes away. Um, but the evidence for it, I'd say, is shakier than the, the argument that immigration tends to be more of lead to economic growth. J just to follow up for a second, I recall Orozco Suarez's research from the, oh, about 12 years ago in which he commented that not necessarily in terms of jobs, but in terms of uh, economics. Uh, immigration in the United States generally tends to uh, bring about a net gain. There's a, a, this last week in The Economist, they did a whole feature on uh, Hispanic immigration to the US. It's quite interesting. And their conclusion was, uh, demographically speaking, America is so much more youthful than Europe. Our average age is like 30. And thank God for immigrants, because Europe looks at itself in the canes and aging. And, uh, and they get immigrants as well, but not the demographic the, as youthful. And that makes a difference in how an economy works. Hey, so you said that in recent years, we've had a much bigger um, sending people back. Mm -hmm. Have you found what the correlation is with that? Does it correlate with anything? Is there, what's the biggest reason behind that? Uh, well, the much more aggressive enforcement in the United States right. and also certain legal changes. There's a, there are better search engines and biometric data. So I don't know how many of you have noticed if you go in and out of the country, immigrants actually, they get their irises scanned and they have digital fingerprints. Um, and so in the old days, you know, somebody was committed a small crime in one state, you would never match those people. 
Today, there's much bigger databases, so people get matched, and that's how removals happen, raids happen, and, uh, and the crackdown on uh, the, the actual green cards, the documents are a little are harder to forge, so all those combined made it easier. And, and also, quite frankly, DHS set a goal. Their, our, their goal is to remove 400,000 people a year. You set a goal, they delivered. Any, a question back there, okay. Actually, two questions. The first question is, what kind of uh, repercussions do immigrants face when they're relocated back to their country? Uh. Do they face um, like criminal charges here in the U.S., or do they face um, criminal charges back in their home country? Yeah. So um, the, the removal does mark the person, and, and in many cases, they cannot re-enter for at least 10 years, depending on why they were removed. If it was just for not having uh, authorization, it's a 10-year delay. If you've c uh, committed a serious crime, it's a lifetime ban. Um, there are some really interesting repercussions. Um, I mentioned the Dreamers. Now there's a group in Mexico called Los Otros Dreamers. The other Dreamers. What are the other Dreamers? So think of that number, 4 million. 3 million of them are Mexican. A lot of them were whole families. Like if your mom and dad are removed and you're 15 or 16, you're probably not going to stay on your own. So Mexico has this interesting phenomenon of a rising number of sometimes American citizens or not who are youth. They don't speak Spanish well. Their education is not recognized in Mexico. They can't get their high school transcripts because a lot of places you actually have to go back to your high school to get your transcripts. So then they can't get into college in Mexico, even if they do speak Spanish. And so it's actually, there's a growing population of the other dreamers who are saying, hey, we, we count. You know, why aren't we able to? You know, it's become a problem for Mexico. To the point that in some jurisdictions in Mexico, they have to teach Spanish as a second language. So for every migration, there's a counter-migration. And it, it's a, a very profound one. Um, there are a lot of costs, too. If you can imagine, families get pulled apart. And that's why, for, for many Latinos, if you ask any person on the street, most people don't know someone who's been removed. One in three Latinos do know someone who's been removed. And that's why it's such a powerful for issue. It's not just Latinos. Other people get removed as well. But 90% of the removals are Latinos. OK. And the second question was, in your studies, did you find a percentage of workers that were skilled versus workers that were unskilled that immigrated into the United States? Absolutely. Um, uh, there are a lot of highly skilled immigrants, and then the, the Certainly, the um, various H-1B visas, like the high skilled, where you have to have a college degree. And so we get a lot of highly skilled workers. Um, and uh, you know, as probably more high skilled workers than low skilled workers yeah, in terms of formal channels. This is really interesting. You noted that uh, uh, a pathway to citizenship is imperative as part of the plan that you've developed for many of these urban migrants. And I, I wonder about this myself at times. Is the pathway to citizenship an essentiality? Would many immigrants here, those that are undocumented, be satisfied with a, um, for lack of a better term, a more or less permanent legal status as opposed to citizenship? Legal authorization. So um, a couple years ago, there was a group called the Gang of Eight, who were four Republican and four uh, Democratic senators who passed an immigration reform bill in the Senate. It never was even voted on in the House. Uh, but in that bill, there was a path to citizenship. It took 13 years. And that's the fastest you could become a citizen. So there was uh, an effort to, to give people legal presence but they didn't want full citizenship. Um, I think they were afraid of maybe the voting implications. On the same time, there is a growing organizations and some of the big 
uh, metropolitan areas, LA, Chicago, New York, that are really promoting um, naturalization. That is, if you're here legally, as a legal permanent, become a citizen. And um, like New York City has this incredible, the Mayor's Office of Immigration Affairs that ha sends buses out to certain neighborhoods that you're legal, become a citizen. Because I, I think the belief is that citizens' voices count more, and they vo vote more, and uh, they're more engaged. And so there's a lot of, ca at the same time you get these pushbacks, you also get certain jurisdictions pushing hard to, to more aggressively include people. We have time for one more question. One more question. Oh, OK. This is just something that I heard when Obama just re did his executive action on immigration reform about um, immigrants who in other countries who are waiting to immigrate legally. Mm -hmm. You know, this is just people's well, hearsay or whatever, that, that the current immigration executive action that he took was going to make that much harder for people who were waiting to come in legally because we were just going to legalize four million people. Right, so that's a long way. The, the short answer is that they're, they're, they're not given a path to citizenship, they're just being promised not to be removed, not to be deported. Um, uh, the new law, DAPA, hasn't gone into effect yet because it's held up in the courts. There's a Texas judge that stopped that. And in terms of, I always am amused by get in line, there's no one line. There are like 25, and people, depending on where you're, like even family renewal, you can get in line and wait to bring, say, a, a, a Mexican brother or sister, but to do that in the line takes 20 years. So there is no line. There are many lines, and it really depends on what country you're from, what, your, what visa status you entered in. But what DACA does is gives deferred, basically, removal. And the DAPA, if, when and if it ever becomes an executive order, uh, could uh, stop the removal of parents who are unauthorized, but their children are citizens. Not really making it any more difficult for people who no. are waiting to come in anyway. No. Okay. That's, those are really two different streams. But thank you. You are a wonderful audience. And if you have any other questions afterwards, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you.